welcome to the Children Caught in Crises Forum. Global Justice is so pleased to present to you this video conference that looks at the key issues for pathways for children that are unaccompanied or separated from adults during difficult circumstances. We are so pleased to be presenting this session with our fellow for children's advocacy, Sarah Bond. This is a live broadcast. And so throughout this broadcast, we'll be inviting our live audience to join with us with your comments and questions. We'll be responding to those comments and questions as we have time and context in the broadcast. I'm Sosma Samu Burnett, and I am founder and president of Global Justice and will be serving as your moderator throughout this program. I also wanna share with you that for the best audiovisual response, we wanna make sure that you are turning off all of your other programs so that you can see the best audiovisual for this presentation. And to our live audience, we thank you for joining us. And now we'd like to introduce our presenter, Sarah Bond. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Sesama. It's good to be here with you all. Oh, it's great to have you here. Now, before we kind of get started, I want to share with the audience a little context for your work. Um, as we've shared, this is entitled Children Caught in Crises, Pathways for Undocumented and Separated Minors. Now, this issue was very, very front and center for quite a while because there were severe humanitarian concerns at the border and in other parts of the world. And so we're going to dive into that through this presentation, and you'll be sharing quite a bit of your research that you've been conducting. Now, Sarah has been with us as a fellow starting in January through to today, and she's going to share the results of her research. But we want you to get to know Sarah a little bit before she shares her research. So I want to start, Sarah, with just a little bit about you. Um, so tell me a little bit about your background, uh, where you are, you know, how you came to do what you do. Yeah, so um, Sosa and I first crossed paths when I was working at William Jessup University in student leadership, and um, I began to explore my passions for the marginalized, especially um, as I was cultivating leadership and influence in these students and had experienced a lot of world travel and service learning projects myself in college, I just really felt drawn more and more to those that were on the fringes, um, especially the um, survivors of human trafficking. Um, I had the opportunity in college to go to Calcutta, India and um, experience some of the nonprofits that were rehabilitating women and giving them a new form of income to buy themselves out of slavery. And more and more, I felt a draw in that direction to research and be able to organize at a community level. And so Sosama and I met even back in those days um, for her to speak into my journey. And I ultimately chose to um, pursue a master's in urban studies with a concentration in community development. And throughout that time, I had many mentors in the field who are working in foster care advocacy, uh, pre prevention of human trafficking and response to human trafficking across the world. And ultimately found myself living and continuing to serve in the Sacramento region in California and completed that master's degree. Sosama was my thesis advisor, and I did a, a study in foster care resilience and human trafficking prevention in former foster youth. And so the layers of this kind of background for me have been rich. I also grew up in a nonprofit that my parents worked at for at-risk youth in Grass Valley um, called Christian Encounter Ministries, and that was hugely influential in setting me up for this kind of passion and awareness of the needs of vulnerable teens and youth and children. So mm -hmm. it wasn't too big of a surprise that after working in human trafficking prevention and foster care um, support and uh, mentorship, that when this issue, especially in 2018 with posts of conditions in the shelters and the um, just the impact of the numbers surging at the border. Um, I really had a heart for children that were getting lost in the system, um, that were not receiving the kind of care or advocacy that they needed. And um, in 2019, that kind of got to a breaking point for me. And I was just thankful that Sosama and I have stayed in touch over the years across different projects. So we kind of picked up those conversations again in the fall. Oh, that's great. You know, it's wonderful to see all that your path has led you to, especially there in Northern California, now working with us here in Colorado and with other programs and uh, organizations around the country. It's very exciting to see that progression. Um, I did want to share a little bit more about uh, the children's concerns. You've talked about this already uh, in the work and your progression with that, but tell me how you are feeling so passionate about working specifically on this set of children's issues. What led you to this project? Yeah, well, after 
just researching anytime a, an article popped up on social media or I heard um, got wind of something that was happening with unaccompanied minors coming to the US I began to just dig into articles and studies that were coming out about this population and when I attended a leadership conference in the fall there was a breakout session I attended that really um, the presenter didn't even intend to talk about that topic, but it came out of her heart as a leader in Berkeley with the immigrant community. And she said, we need moms of our present generation to rise up and stand up for the welfare of children that are not their own because other moms can't stand up for these children who have been taken from them or separated from them um, to say, even as moms of U.S. citizens, that we will not stand for the treatment of any child, um, especially in our own country, um, mm -hmm. the kind of um, gaps that were that are present in the care for these children. And a government system can never adequately care for a child because children need families and they need love, loving, um, significant adults for resilience. And so that was my breaking point. I immediately stepped away from the breakout sessions for the rest of the day at that conference and sat down at a bench and just began to write out every person I knew that could be a contact in this field mm -hmm. and began to go back to post I had seen of Sosimas um, because I was just from feeling grieved to feeling certain that I needed to do something and I um, didn't want to look back at this season and go oh I could have it was just a thought or it was just a grief but I didn't do anything with it it really inspired me because of my faith to to act on behalf of children and I'm a mom myself of two boys who are five and two right now. And so, especially as I read stories from a parent's perspective, and especially of young ones who do not understand what's happening to them, that was really a breaking point for me. Mm -hmm. Well, this idea, you know, being a mom and seeing the, the plight of kids, I can really resonate with that as a, being a mother myself. And then you also talked about your faith, you know, just expand on that a little bit. How does your faith relate to this work for you? Yeah, well, I include a little bit of that in the presentation to come and I'll dig into that some more. But um, finding this common ground, even with SOSIMA and your organization with Global that I've been able to serve with, I love that it's larger than a concept of economic justice or social justice. It's a dignity and a and a worth that because of my faith and believing that the image of God as a as a Christ follower is stamped on each one of us that we were made in God's image. Mm -hmm. I just firmly believe that there is a dignity and a value of every human life. And that's especially relevant in the conversations that are happening right now with Black Lives Matter. There are certain populations that have been excluded from that and have been set in a tier system of how we view them and how we advocate for them. And unfortunately, children from other countries, anyone from another country who comes to the U.S., the rhetoric has been um, so degrading to the worth that those that these people carry, that they share. And so I'm just um, very passionate about working with others who share that kind of value of humanity, whether they're from a faith background or not. You can find incredible leaders who affirm the value of the human life and especially of these children who um are completely vulnerable to the care and the decisions one of a lot of our conversations Sosima and I along the way have been that there's so much out of a child's power and where they go and how they're treated and then what they experience when they get here so it's especially relevant for any of us whether we're a, a parent who's very concerned about the treatment of other children whether we're a pastor a leader um, mm -hmm. or an advocate already or a business person every one of us can do something and so that really inspired me that um, God calls us not to just love in word, but into um, deed and action and in truth. And so that plus just knowing that we are all connected, that when, you know, the Bible talks about when one part of the body hurts, another part hurts. And that's our shared humanity, that um, we can't look away from that pain because it is a pain that we all share and should carry for one another. Right. And one final question, uh, just by way of introduction, you know, this particular event uh, is an opportunity for you to share your research on this topic. Tell us a little bit about your personal significance of, of this opportunity in this forum. Yeah, well, I have been working for the last um, about five years in co-founding a nonprofit to equip women for leadership. And I especially have loved 
the opportunities that um, my mom and I as co-founders of Voice of Courage have the opportunity. She's continuing that work. And, and with that call in the fall to really do something about this topic, I knew that I needed to readjust my commitments. As a mom, I'm only able to work part-time in this season. I still largely have my children at home. And I just knew if I needed to reorder the priorities of who most needed, I felt like my time and attention in this season, I knew I felt committed to um, cutting out other commitments and stepping away and transitioning out so I could focus on this advocacy work. Mm -hmm. Again, that draw of moving towards those who have the least advocacy, who are the most marginalized and need access um, through our awareness and through our support to services in the country. Um, this is just personally significant to me because it's fulfilling that longing of mine that resurfaces again and again throughout my life to just go to where there's the most pain and be hope there. And so this has just been a really exciting transition for me back into this work. And there are seasons that fit, you know, motherhood well. Um, and I've been just grateful that in each season I can pour into those, even from behind the scenes, pour into leaders who are serving marginalized communities. But I'm excited to be back in this work more directly myself. And it's also significant because this research is not just to be printed and published or to sit in a dusty drawer somewhere, but it's to prepare a foundation for informed action and organizing and collaboration. So I'm very excited in this transition for um, some teaching opportunities I'll now have on these topics and just equipping college students for this kind of work and then just being more of a visible leader who can help refer people to the incredible work that's already being done out there. So this is an important transition and stepping stone for me that I'm really grateful for. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That's wonderful to know and a great context for our presentation. If you are just joining us in the live audience, this is the Children Caught in Crises video conference. We are looking at the issues of pathways for unaccompanied and separated children. Sarah Bond, our fellow in children's advocacy, is going to be presenting her research through this time. If you are in our live audience, we want to also remind you that you can ask questions and provide comments throughout this broadcast. There is a question box there where you can type in your notes and we'll be tracking along with you and incorporating your questions as time and context permit. Now, what we're going to do now is do a little transition where I'm going to be sharing uh, 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 Sarah's PowerPoint and Sarah will be sharing her presentation. So please join with me for that. Thank you, Sosama. Well, we shared a little bit about the background and the impetus for why I got into this work and this incredible opportunity with Sosama, but I also just wanna set um, the context. Um, as many of us are experiencing um, staying, staying home, sheltering in place, um, being uh, very aware of the global pandemic, as many of you are probably healthcare providers and other frontline service people or um, the loved one of someone who is serving, I want to just remind you that um, this topic is not a tangent or a side note um, during the present pandemic. It's actually, in fact, being very affected by the current pandemic. As you may be aware of, the um, the situation between our administration and the way that the border is being controlled has dramatically changed and the way that children even who are in um, our U.S. government care, unaccompanied minors who have come primarily from Central America, they have experienced rapid deportation without notice to family members or others who could advocate for them. So this topic is particularly relevant and it's changing day to day, even from when I completed my research in March and um, completed my writing in April, there's already ongoing things that you'll probably see in here that are adding new layers to this issue. So thank you for taking time while you have been, I'm sure each of you, dramatically impacted in your life and your family and your loved ones and your community by the global pandemic. Just know that this topic is deeply relevant and a population that is already vulnerable becomes even more vulnerable during a pandemic like we are experiencing right now. So let's jump right in on to why I embarked on this journey. So um, as Sosama and I just talked about in the introduction, if you're just joining us, um, I have a background in child welfare with um, foster care advocacy, a BA in psychology, and then a master's in urban community development with um, urban, um, urban studies with a concentration in community development. And during that period, I had the opportunity to look at the um, resources that 
foster youth need to be resilient. And in many ways, they share many facets of um, need for protection from vulnerability and uh, social capital building and resilience building that this population of unaccompanied and separated children coming from out of country experience in the US. So that foundation was not a huge leap for me, but understanding the immigration system, understanding the specific contexts and programs that allow us to advocate for this population in our country was very new to me. So those were some of the questions that I really dove into during this project. I was aware in 2018 of Trump's zero tolerance policy and the rapid um, arrests of parents who were crossing the border with their children and the separation of children. You probably saw those reports back in 2018 of children who were by the thousands being separated from their parents and put into almost internment camp type context, chain link fences, tents in the desert. And so that was highly um, disturbing to me back in 2018. I shared articles with family members and talked often with my family about this issue, but it wasn't until 2019 that I began to feel a clear prompt to act in this issue, to move from grief and disbelief into action. And so I began to network with organizers and leaders like Sosama Samuel Burnett because I knew of her work with Global. She had served as my thesis advisor back in grad school when I did the foster care advocacy paper. And I knew that she had posted some things recently on social media back in the fall that looked at um, the challenges of both protecting our borders and the human rights concerns of those who were coming. And I knew that she was already grappling with the two sides of that. And so I made a list of all the leaders that I knew in this area, local leaders from Sacramento area, um, those that had worked in immigration legal services before. And SOSIMA was on the top of the list of understanding um, the public policy side of what was happening and the advocacy side. And so she and I began a series of conversations in the fall that really led to ultimately by December, her extending the opportunity to serve as a research fellow. And that just felt like absolutely yes, the right thing I needed to do. And it didn't come without sacrifice. There were a few areas of leadership that I loved that I knew as a mom with young kids that I needed to transition out of some things that were not the ultimate best in this season for my time and resources and to move in a direction of caring for some of the most vulnerable in these children. I just knew I couldn't look away. So why does this topic matter? On the next slide, um, you see that this matters for each individual child, but also matters for our society at large. Um, the American Pediatric Society talks about the trauma that is found in these unaccompanied minors who are coming to the US in the thousands, in the tens of thousands every year and have been um, notably since 2012. So for each individual child who's experienced this kind of trauma, we see layers of trauma because they have fled traumatic situations in Central America, 92% of the children that come to the US and enter our unaccompanied alien children program under the Office of Refugee Resettlement, they are from the Northern Triangle of Central America. That includes Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. And we'll dig into them in a minute why that's happening from these particular countries and why there's such a, a significant trend linked back to the Northern Triangle. Um, but the layers of vulnerability that these children have experienced and the layers of trauma, almost every child studied in the care of Health and Human Services and ORR specifically, they demonstrate signs of PTSD. And so for us to be tuned into the needs of these children who are placed by the thousands across the country every year, released to sponsors in many, almost every state in the US, um, these children bring with them um, imprints of trauma in their DNA. They have um, layers of trauma that will affect the future of our society. Not only is this a child welfare concern, but it's also a social health concern of how we look at the treatment of these children and helping them set up for resilience so that they can become, um, so they can have a hope and a future for their own lives and so that they can also become contributing members of society um, for the well being of our whole society. There's a recent report, even as recently as this spring in March, from Senator Kamala Harris in California, along with some of her other Senator colleagues, who share that there are just huge oversights and, um, and abusive and exploitive practices happening within the government's care. And that's just the start of the issues because children are also vulnerable after they are rapidly released from Health and Human Services care in many cases, and there's very little follow-up. So we'll dig into all those aspects in a moment. Of what are the biggest needs? And um, where are those intersections of places that we can most get involved? 
as people of faith, this is significant to me personally as a follower of Christ, as a Christian, um, because I deeply have studied scripture and seen the connections between um, my faith and God's heart for the most vulnerable. Throughout scripture, we hear um, commands for um, for believers to stand in the gap for strangers, to practice radical hospitality and welcome in strangers. In James 1 27, one of my favorite verses in scripture, um, the apostle um, writing the words of Christ and the heart of Christ talks about how pure and undefiled religion before God is to care for orphans and widows in their distress. And so it's very rare to see the word religion even in the Bible. But for um, someone who walked closely with Christ to write that about the heart of Christ, that his heart is most with those that are most overlooked and most vulnerable, not with the powerful or the rich. Um, I have found um, just great fulfillment of my faith and beauty of humanity and our shared humanity the more that I've moved towards marginalized populations. And I come to this work with a desire to practice humility and a teachable learner spirit and to see um, as one of my favorite books by Corbett and Fickert called When Helping Hurts talks about our shared poverty, that each of us has a poverty, whether it's in our relationship with God, ourselves, the world or one another, that we approach these kind of topics from a place of shared humanity and shared poverty, that we all have places we need to learn and grow and that we can also look for the strengths and the beauty among even a marginalized population and a vulnerable population like unaccompanied and separated children who've come from other countries. On this next slide, I wanna share a little bit about how big of an issue this is as a backdrop for our conversation. It might be a little hard for you to see the numbers coming up the side, um, but that's um, back in 2012, the numbers of unaccompanied minors apprehended by Customs and Border Patrol was about 20,000. And you can tell by 2014, there was a huge leap in these numbers and a similar leap in 2016, as well as in 2019. Um, there's a difference between the projected numbers and the forecasted numbers and the actual. So the last actual that was um, captured in this is the, the dark pink here. But um, like I said, 92% of the children who are coming and entering the unaccompanied um, alien children program, the word alien, by the way, can come with a lot of negative connotations. So I'm using that only in terms of talking about the specific program provided by the Office of Refugee Resettlement. So in this program, they have seen that 92% of the children they've taken care of have been from the Northern Triangle of Central America. And the reason why that's happening as you dig into the cultural, social, environmental factors that are happening there is a combination of vulnerability factors that have kind of created a perfect storm for instability, poverty, and fear and danger within that country. So one of the factors there is that the Northern Triangle of Central America is one of the most vulnerable to major environmental disasters in the world. They have extreme drought, um, erosion, and other things that have created um, an unstable land for farming, it has um, increased poverty and a lack of food supply. And that trickles down to instability within families who are desperately poor, can't meet the basic needs of their children, can create a surge in depression and other mental health issues when families can't meet their basic needs and are disempowered to um, live and create a, a beautiful lifestyle, a, a sustainable lifestyle. And so children are coming, they're fleeing sometimes neglectful families. They're also coming sometimes because their family is sending them alone to make hundreds of miles trek across Central America across Mexico to our border because they see that as their child's best chance at survival and at a sustainable future. Um, the other conditions that are happening there, we hear about um, drug cartels that are very active um, coming out of Colombia and other places that are also very active in Central America. And there's other um, conditions like um, the fact that we deported um, some major LA gangs that had formed El Salvadorian gangs of immigrants who have been deported in the 90s and they took those very well organized gangs that had formed as a resistance to our own US LA gangs of US born citizens and they took that kind of dangerous subculture right back into these countries and so you have corruption of leadership you have danger you have children being killed and women being raped and we see that even into Mexico 
Um, although children who come from Mexico are not as welcome into our country, they're often deported and repatriated straight back into Mexico because they're just across the border. And so that's why some of those same conditions are happening across Mexico, but 92% of the children we have here um, in our programs in the US are from Central America because they're from further away from another country and the rules and restrictions, depending on what country you're from, um, change whether how we treat children when they arrive here and what kind of process they need to be deported back into their country. Before we get into some research questions and findings about this topic, I wanna move on to some key terms. So we have a good foundation of shared understanding of some of the terms that I'll be throwing out and some of the acronyms. And you've probably heard some of these key players, and so I wanna share a little bit about them as a snapshot for helping you when you're researching on your own and digging further into this to understand how these organizations and terms intersect to this topic. So customs and border protection, they don't play a huge role in our conversation today, but like I shared on those numbers, um, once children are apprehended at the border, within 72 hours um, of being apprehended by customs and border protection, um, who is the parent agency for Border Patrol. Border Patrol has 72 hours to refer a child from being detained at the border and, and to be transferred over to the care of Health and Human Services. Health and Human Services is the parent organization of several offices, including the Office of Refugee Resettlement, who has been charged with taking care of both refugee children and unaccompanied minors, who they call unaccompanied alien children. And so refugee children are handled in a completely separate program under ORR, but um, the uh, Office of Refugee Resettlement has an unaccompanied alien children program and for any immigrant child who comes that means they haven't been referred by another nation as a refugee child they are um, processed the same whether they were separated at the border from an adult who was arrested or detained for some reason or was suspected for child trafficking or other illegal activity um, they process children the same within their unaccompanied alien children program whether that child is separated or came to the border alone Entry without inspection, or EWI as it's called. I ran across this term when I was talking with the Public Law Center of Santa Monica, who down near LA, for those of you that aren't from California, they, um, they explained that they've run across a lot of children who need their assistance, who have entered I hope that you can all hear me again. Um, so entry without inspection, um, I'm just gonna go back to that one, is when children cross through an unofficial um, entry into the US and not through an official port of entry. And this may mean that children aren't immediately introduced into a system of resources in the United States, and they might go directly to someone in the community that they know, or they might make their way to a sponsor, a relative in the United States. So what is the difference between immigrant and refugee? These can get complicated um, and these definitions can get um, confused very easily. So I just wanna briefly clarify the difference because for the purpose of my research, we're only looking at immigrant unaccompanied minors who come to the US and refugees experience a different um, set of resources, often more resources. So refugees, they are referred by a third party country who says um, these, these women and children, these adults and children have experienced a set of key standards and they qualify as a refugee so they can be referred to the United States. And so they are already kind of guaranteed a place if we have, um, if we're allowing them in to the US or into another country, they already have a clear refugee status to um, be resettled and assisted when they arrive to the US. Immigrants, on the other hand, um, need to make a case to stay. Um, it can be a years long journey of um, making their case and then having to wait in Mexico, or they might have to wait three to six months even to be seen as an immigrant. So we're only looking at immigrant children who come and immigrants may have, they may be fleeing danger and other scenarios, but they haven't come referred as a refugee. So there could be some similarities of vulnerability um, and fleeing from legitimate cause of fear, but there's a difference there in how they arrive to the US and what their legal process will be like moving forward. 
So Immigration and Customs Enforcement, we've heard as well, um, they are um, an organization that um, helps control people within the United States. They might have, um, we hear about them when they are um, raiding throughout the U.S. and um, and ICE is specifically relevant for this topic, not because we're looking at raids and other things, but because they play a role with the Office of Refugee Resettlement. They need to be notified 25, uh, 24 hours before and 24 hours after a child is placed by ORR with a sponsor somewhere in the United States. They also play a tricky role that we'll get to in a moment and that can um, actually limit and, and cause some tricky situations for undocumented um, citizens or undocumented residents in the U.S. when they're trying to become a sponsor because ORR shares information with ICE if they, notif if they find someone who is um, undocumented or doesn't have a permanent legal status to stay in the U.S. A sponsor is often a next of kin um, individual in the United States, like an aunt or an uncle or a cousin who already lives here. And this child from Central America or Mexico is coming, they know of this person or ORR helps find this person and ORR has specific steps from the day that a child enters their program in about 50 to 70 days, sometimes longer. Um, They're trying to identify, background check a sponsor and arrange a place for that child, a way for that child to fly or um, get transported to that sponsor. Um, unaccompanied alien children, again, is the terminology that the Office of Refugee Resettlement uses for these children, and um, that is their program for children. So let's move on um, to the next the next aspect here, which is looking at our research questions. So to narrow down this topic, I looked specifically at five research questions. And the first one involves what are the legal processes and stages that the government uses to receive a child, to apprehend them, and then to transfer them as they cross the border, as they process through health and human services facilities and receive placements in the community. The second question I had was, what are foreign-born unaccompanied minors and separated children's greatest needs as they make this journey throughout the United States, both when they're in government care and when they're released to the community or found in the community if they entered without inspection? Third, how can, US, how can the U.S. government and service providers best care for, represent, and place unaccompanied migrant children? So what is the place, what is the ideal placement, and what is the ideal process for this, and how well is it doing, was my question. Fourth, how are legal advocates and social service providers and advocacy groups at a community level providing for children with comprehensive support? So this is looking at what is already happening across the U.S. at a community level with maybe parachurch organizations, nonprofits, maybe organizations that already interface with the government. And then how can volunteers like us at a community level best advocate for and assist children who are either in the care of the government or are in family placements or other scenarios across the country? So I wanted to know what are our points of intersection? To answer these questions, um, under the methodology, I performed a literature review looking at articles that helped explain what was happening to children under the government's care and what the process is like, and to look at sources revealing what children need most when they are in the community level. Since they're just briefly, hopefully, in the government's care, some get stuck there for a while, but there's a lot more time that they're going to be years and the rest of their lifetime if they stay in the U.S. that they're going to need follow-up care. Second, I looked at interviews with each sector statewide. I looked at specifically the government. I talked with ORR's hotline for sponsors and children placed in the community. I talked with um, major international organizations like Kids in Need of Defense that play a key role in this. And I talked with church leaders and volunteers and individuals who are just organizing at the community level. I also talked with legal teams who are assisting children and with former advocates who have helped children while they are under the care of ORR, since that's a very unique and very regulated source of connection with children when they're under the care of ORR. And last, I had the opportunity right before COVID shut down state travel in California to go down to San Diego and go across the border with an amazing leader, Jill Zwires, of Friendships No Fronteras, 
and you should definitely check her out and follow her. That's a little plug for her. She is an incredible leader who just saw these migrant trains arriving to Tijuana, and I had the opportunity to go down and meet with her and also meet with some church leaders from San Diego churches that are working for, have worked for decades with immigrant communities in Southern California, and they have identified ways of assisting children, housing children, and helping them apply for DACA. And so just some incredible site visits down there. This is a picture here of me with a migrant leader who is, um, she traveled in Mexico um, across the country to get to Tijuana to apply for an asylum interview um, in an ice box. And um, she's seen that her case is probably not very um, likely to be seen by um, the US and favorably. And so she, um, in the meantime, and maybe permanently has really just owned a leadership role at one of the emergency shelters for asylum seekers who are waiting at the border. And this might seem unrelated to the unaccompanied minors topic, but it's actually very relevant because it's providing a way of prevention of family separation. And so this is a food delivery that, that um, generous donations provided for us to drop off that day. And we went to a local marketplace and dropped off all this food. And um, this is a very insightful trip that I'll get back to when we're um, moving forward to recommendations in a moment. So what are the findings of this um, study? Now that we've looked at key terms and we've looked at some of the numbers and why children are coming, where are they found in the United States? So to answer that first question, we have a split immediately when children enter the United States. Some enter without inspection, and they're found later by an organization that, that someone in the community might refer them to, like to kids in need of defense. A church volunteer might meet a family who's housing an unaccompanied minor or someone like the Public Law Center um, of Santa Monica might receive word that some adults in a household need immigrant uh, legal services, and they might discover that there's children that are former unaccompanied minors who were released from the government's care or maybe entered without inspection who are also in need of assistance. If children enter through an official port of entry, whether they're sent by an adult across the bridge, um, whether they are traveling from Central America by themselves, or whether they are separated from families when they reach the border, they have 72 hours for border patrol to refer them over to ORR, like I mentioned. Children are then transitioned into the care of a sponsor if they go through ORR, and that child is um, hopefully reunited with a loved one or a relative. That's the first, that's the best case scenario, if that person's safe. Um, and then they have access to, um, follow-up services through ORR if they know of them. That's the ideal best case scenario that's designed by ORR. If children cannot find a sponsor, a next of kin family member in the United States who's safe, and this includes not having um, a sponsor who is a relative of their abuser maybe back in Central America, then they can go onto a long wait list an organization like Catholic Charities or Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services are the two main organizations that then receive referrals from ORR. That, that means that children need a placement in the U.S. with a foster family, and currently they're not eligible for adoption in the U.S., but these children need a safe family that will support them, that will um, help them transition into adulthood and a lot of times this becomes like a long-term family system both the foster the individual foster care agency like in california it's international christian adoption who receives those names from lutheran family services and that is received from orr so that's kind of the trickle down effect of children coming from government care um, and either going to a sponsor's care or into a foster family there are many children sadly that sit on these lists for years for um two years, three years or more that don't have a viable sponsor and have not received a foster family agency. So that will be a big follow-up point in our recommendations in a moment. If children enter without inspection and they are found in the home of um, maybe an immigrant family, they might be at risk for trafficking. Within 72 hours if a child is not identified when they enter the streets in the U.S., they are likely picked up by a trafficker. That's true of any child who goes AWOL in the United States. So that's also true um, and a very real vulnerability for these children if they're not going through an official port of entry and assisted with safe people in their lives. So if a child is in an unstable environment, then CPS might get involved and they would enter a foster care system like International Christian Adoptions who then tries to find a viable safe placement. 
if the child is in a stable environment, then they can continue to be assisted by public law center, kind other child advocates who can help that child maybe um, make their case for a legal permanent reason to stay in the U.S. And um, so those are the main ways that children are found in the U.S. And these are this is an important backdrop for understanding when and how and where we can get involved as advocates. So that's our background picture. So where we know where children are found, but what are unaccompanied minors' major needs? So these migrant children who arrive that are separated or arrive un unaccompanied, they have first a need of high standards of mental and physical care. Like I mentioned, where Kamala Harris and other senators recently complained to the U.S. government that the care that's being offered them through ORR is substandard and even dangerous, one of the complaints there is a very real concern about the weaponizing of therapy sessions. So children are guaranteed when they enter ORR, they're supposed to be legally um, required to be provided with the least restrictive setting possible and to have a rapid placement with a sponsor as safe as possible and, um, and that they would also be protected from trafficking and other vulnerabilities that have been put in place to protect children in the United States over these years. But the problem we're seeing is that one of the services offered children is therapy, and rightfully so because of the trauma they've experienced. But what's happening is that the information that these children provide in their therapy sessions while in health and human services shelters could be shared to use against them in immigration court. And so that information sharing is considered a weaponization of therapy um, because that information that they're sharing out of their vulnerability and in a safe, hopefully confidential place is actually being used against them. Next, we're seeing major reports from the American Pediatric Society and the American Medical Association talking about coercive medical practices that are being used among children in homes to keep them lethargic, they're using depression medication, Zoloft and others against a child's will even sometimes, or threatening to write the children up with a significant um, event or um, kind of a, a slap on the wrist that is put into the child's file that actually delays their placement with a sponsor or foster family. And these children are being drugged to make them easier and more pliable to deal with but um, it's causing weight gain. It's a coercive, very concerning use of medical practice. And um, it also means that children can't speak up about their case or ask questions, and it creates all kinds of health outcomes and concerns for children. So these are just a few of the things that, as I scratch the surface, of what's happening for these children. And all of them are experiencing trauma, but there aren't enough counselors. Um, they have high caseloads and they're not able to meet regularly. So maybe a child, if they're there for a couple months, might only meet with a counselor a couple times or have group therapy before they're moved to a new context in the community or to a new facility, and that can disrupt their care. So the next thing that children really need is legal advocacy. If a child has a legal advocate, like a lawyer, a pro bono lawyer, or an organization like KIND to walk with them and provide legal services, they're five times more likely to be able to make their case and share the information about their background that can help them receive permanent legal status in the United States. So we need lawyers and we also need child advocates like an organization that Young Center provides for children when they're in the care of ORR. These child advocates maximize what a lawyer could do for a set of their cases because a child advocate works directly. They're trained to gather information and to be a safe person in that child's life to encourage them and to also um, capture and report things about that child's story that can help with their case to actually advocate for the child's best interests. So we have a program like that in the US called CASA for foster youth that are domestic children in the US. And this is similar, it's a child advocate program by the Young Center for migrant children. So legal advocacy um, is a huge need and protection from further abuse. I mentioned that children need to be protected from, um, from exploitation, from sex trafficking, from human trafficking and labor trafficking as well in the U.S. So they need to be ensured that they're placed with safe sponsors and safe homes. There are just chilling reports coming out about children that have been abused by other children in their foster placements. And that's similar to what we see in our domestic foster care system, that children can be vulnerable. There are amazing foster homes out there, but there are also foster families that are not providing the kind of care that children need, and it's compounding the trauma. 
So um, another couple of things that are happening is that children are being forced to wait with their parents in Mexico in a queue system that could take three to six months to be seen by um, immigration um, interrogation at the border for them to make their case and then to submit an asylum application that then starts the clock on a couple years process. There are a couple programs that are creating these problems in recent policies through the government. One is the Migrant Protections Protocol called the Wait in Mexico. That's kind of the slang for it is the Wait in Mexico. And it's not protective by any means because it's forcing families to wait in Mexico after they submit their application. Some families are allowed to cross the border and they have to wear ankle chains but for families that are waiting at the border that maybe are living in tent cities, they are being picked at by exploitive groups, by militant groups, drug cartels, and some family members are going missing or the conditions become so dangerous for a child to remain that friends of the family will walk the kids to a port of entry and tell them, turn yourself in, go into the foster care system because at least you're more protected than you would be here. So this kind of dangerous policy um, is having all these side effects of keeping families vulnerable in a condition where they don't have the kind of protection and resources they need at the border. So safe homes and, and sponsors are also a big need. As I mentioned, um, ideally this would be with family or next of kin. Um, but there's that, that sharing of information between ICE and ORR that could actually lead to fear in would-be sponsors who would apply to take care of, um, in one case, a woman from Guatemala had lived here for years, and then she got in touch with um, the Public Law Center of Santa Monica because she was trying to apply to be a legal sponsor for ORR for the, her nephew and her own son, and it actually turned her into um, ICE and into trouble with the law because she was a, a, an upstanding citizen here, but she didn't have legal status. And so sponsors who could be very secure for a child are actually now afraid to step up because many of them are getting turned into ICE and apprehended themselves. And last, children need social capital and empowerment. So ideally, the homes and the um, shelters, the group homes and the individual private homes that they're placed in um, ideally should expose them to social capital building. Um, for example, one university I talked to is providing weekly um, weekly or monthly um, field trips for children from a local shelter run by Southwest Key programs. And those children get to come to the campus of the University of San Diego regularly to experience different tours and topics presented by different departments that can expose them to future career paths and to students who come alongside them and throw them a pizza party. And so it builds their social capital and their awareness of, hey, I know someone who could help me get into a college someday or could help me through the application process. I have a vision of what that could look like. And so that's kind of the social capital building that we're talking about and the empowerment. And the key here as we're looking at this population is not to overly emphasize the vulnerabilities or overly emphasize the strengths to the neglect of the other, but to look at both the strengths and the vulnerability points of this population so we could best support these children building on their strengths and safeguarding them from the risk factors. So moving on to the next aspect of the findings, we found also in this study through my research, I just met incredible leaders in so many different areas who are standing in the gap. So as I mentioned, there's two pathways for children. There's two places mainly that they're found when we're aware of where they are in the US. And that's under the government's care or released in the community or found in the community because they entered without inspection. So the, the organizations that are helping well children are under the government's care are more limited. These include organizations that have the clearance with the government and the relationship built, the memorandum of understanding to work specifically with children that are in very protected care. And they protect the children so well in OR's care so that they are not vulnerable to exploitation, but it also limits them from many would-be supporters and advocates in the community. So here's a few pathways that organizations have made to serve children under the government's care. First is the Young Centers program. And this program um, actually, like I mentioned, trains and equips volunteers to be child advocates. And they are the appointed organization by the US government to provide that kind of care for children while they are in the government's care. And it could be a very short time, potentially, because children may be quickly placed with a sponsor, but some children are stuck in that system for a very long time. And this person, whether they're there briefly for a few months or for a long time, 
they can show up and be a safe person for that child, a constant presence, a sounding board to reassure them or to help get information to reassure the child and inform them about the process that they're experiencing. And they can also gather information to share that with a legal team who can um, better assist that child from a lawyer's standpoint or from a, an immigration legal services representative who's been trained by the Department of Justice. So the Young Center really stands in a gap there by providing child advocates. They're not found all over the U.S. yet, but if you're interested in finding out more about that, check out Young Center online and you can fill out an information request to see if there are children nearby to you, especially in large metropolitan areas around the country like Chicago, New York, um, Austin, um, and some, some places like LA and San Francisco in California. So um, another place I mentioned is partnerships between universities and shelters. So when a child enters um, ORR's care, regardless of if they enter at the border in Texas, Arizona, California, New Mexico, they are referred to whatever shelter in the US has a bed open. And while children should be placed in the least restrictive setting possible, if they have mental health needs, developmental needs, or if they're just a, a compliant, you know, a child that could have a lot of freedoms and really work with those freedoms, they're not necessarily placed in the least restrictive setting possible because sometimes it just matters how many children need help right then and there um, and where there's a bed open. So a child could be placed in anything from a standard group home, like a house, an unmarked house in a neighborhood that has some security controls on it with um, group home shelter staff. They could be placed in a high, high risk detention facility um, where there's bars, where there's chain link fences, where they're in tents and don't have the resources they need. Um, so they can be placed in anything from like high security to low security, but that's, if we can form partnerships of knowing where those shelters are find, found, and there's there are websites online where we can find out where some of those shelters are, we may be able to form um, partnerships and relationships with those shelters and be an outlet for those monthly required field trips and other services. And a lot of that comes through just rapport and even with changing limitations of what the government requires of shelters um, or allows for the community interfacing for relationships like the University of San Diego and my new friend Maria Silva down there, she has just stuck with it and she stayed in close contact with the shelter workers. And so she's been available when stipulations and regulations change. She's been available and flexible to stay constant on her end and to stay available and committed and yet show incredible flexibility in order to support the kinds of relationships that she can make with the local shelter. And because of that, she's been able to form relationships with the children that really need some strong social capital and mentors in their lives. Organizations like International Christian Adoptions are also doing incredible work. And depending on what state you're in, there's different adoption agencies that are private adoption agencies that receive those um, children's listings from the Lutheran Family Services or Catholic Charities and they provide those names uh, of who's available from ORR and they interface to tell the adoption agency in each state and it's state-based. Some states don't have a international adoption agency that's working with them, but those are the kind of organizations to look for if you're interested in fostering a child or in serving as a host home when a child is aging out of the system and just needs someone to rent a room from and help guide them in life. So there's some programs for both of those things and you can also check that out by your state. Um, if you're looking for organizations like that and you don't know quite where to find them, you can check out immigrationadvocates.org. And then for children that are released or found in the community, the organizations that I found were those like Public Law Center and Casa Cornelia of San Diego that are interfacing with and, and specializing in the needs of unaccompanied uh, migrant children and they're finding children because they're referred to adults and then they're finding that even though organizations like ORR say that they have a hotline and they do have a hotline for sponsors and the children to call back and get resources like counseling or legal services or food or um, furniture, uh, many sponsors don't call back and that's probably because there's a lot of fear and those who are still undergoing a process of obtaining legal status in the U.S. probably don't want to interface with the government any more than they need to. And so even though organizations, um, programs created by the government say 
we have resources and we have databases to refer people in need, um, sponsors and children and immigrants to resources. That's probably not the best pathway or the most accessible pathway for families. So organizations like Public Law Center are recognizing many of these families and their children who have experienced the great traumas that we've shared already today are not accessing um, legal services and often not accessing um, the counseling services that they need to process and heal from the trauma that they've experienced. So that's a big need um, for that kind of follow-up and access. And then there's organizations like Kids in Need of Defense, and they're doing incredible work both in Central America to prevent exploitation and to build resilience, which is a huge need there. And they are doing incredible work at the border, both sides of the California, or the U.S.-Mexico border. They're identifying what service providers exist on both sides and what are the gaps and how they can fill them. They're helping equip children um, to enter the U.S. They're helping children find internships and work experience and are doing incredible things. So check out their website. They had over a 90% success rate last year of all the cases that they pursued on behalf of children were granted a favorable outcome. So incredible, hopeful things that are happening for children. Um, once they're outside of the government's care and KIND is doing great work for that. Then there's World Relief and World Relief up in Sacramento is doing a lot of refugee resettlement work like we talked about for that other um, subset of um, those that are coming from other countries. But down in LA, they're working a lot um, with World Relief of Southern California, helping equip churches to understand why migrants are coming across the border, um, helping build relationships and sharing stories with migrants, sharing with pastors down there so they can really understand the vulnerabilities and the needs that these families and individuals represent. And then they're also helping unaccompanied minors um, find internships and um, especially for those older youth they're helping these children um, transition into adulthood because especially if a child has come at 15 16 17 they're especially looking forward to how they can ensure their own safety and their own sustainability they're not necessarily all that concerned about connecting with a foster family who to them might just signal instability and they might not be excited about integrating to, into the expectations of extended family members and all that comes with that but they want sustainability for the kinds of internships that they need they want work experience they want to make money and be able to stabilize on their own so that's a huge need to be relevant and it's also a recognition which i love about world relief of southern california it's a recognition of the strengths that these young people exhibit. They have been incredibly resilient to make it to the United States on their own oftentimes. They have experienced a lot of danger and they have overcome already so much. Even though they carry that trauma, they also have incredible strength. They um, have adapted to the language oftentimes. They are ready to work hard and have resources if someone will extend a lifeline to them and an opportunity. So I love that World Relief is interfacing with um, partners and other advocates in the community who want to help and helping provide those inter internships and other resources. And then we have ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, and I mentioned them, they're more in the um, public policy and um, appealing to state governors and representatives across the country, but they are doing important work, especially given the, the present pandemic and the weight in Mexico protocol that I mentioned a minute ago. They're helping advocate for the safety of families and they're trying to reduce the, the need for separation and the dangerous conditions that children and families are experiencing, especially right now during the rapid deportations. I just read a, a story on ProPublica's um, page this last week as well as New York Times about how COVID is impacting this population and ACLU is responding and appealing to the US government about safe policies that don't undo decades of work to um, protect child welfare concerns and protect the, uh, pr protect the welfare of children in our country. So if you're specifically interested or gifted or skilled in working with public policy pathways to advocacy, I just wanted to mention that one because it's an incredible organization who's doing important work, especially during the present global crisis. So what are the recommendations for you and I? What are the community-based advocacy um, recommendations that you and I can take and just take a small sweet step towards um, towards movement towards advocacy. So first you can you can choose to serve as a child advocate like I mentioned. This is especially great if you live in a larger community where you can look into being a child advocate through the Young Center. 
But even if you don't live near an organization like that, an office like that, um, or a shelter where children are found in the US run by ORR, you can practice radical hospitality. And this could look like being hospitable by opening your business to a child for an internship, a young adult. And it also can look like actually opening your physical home. Do you have an in-laws quarters where you can bring in a vulnerable family to keep them from being separated? Can you um, create a space in your home for a foster youth, for a child to grow up and have a sense of family and to adopt that child in essence into the culture of your family and, in, and into embracing their culture and their backgrounds? and um, what they hope for for the future. So that's a huge opportunity to reach out to an organization like International Christian Adoptions, whatever version that is for you in your local area, and find a way to support a child in your home. You also, if that's not quite your speed, but you really could support a young adult and you're great with college students and building resilience and independence, you could even house a young adult who is aged out of the system, but isn't quite ready to live on their own and serve as a host through international Christian adoptions or other adoption agencies. In a situation like that, you would house a child who um, is over 18 and you would help coach them through life skills, assist them as they're navigating new resources and schooling or job training and they would rent a room from you and have um, guidelines to abide by so there's some great opportunities for different stages of a child's development depending on what you're gifted to offer also i mentioned that we can create internships like world relief of southern california recommended to me during this research and that could mean even for a church i mean think about how we could provide not just soft skills but technical skills as our sound booth team our tech team could bring in an intern who learns lighting and sound equipment think about how you're preparing that child for maybe a production team or um, a film studio um, profession in the future and so there's opportunities that whether you're a corporate business owner a nonprofit leader um, a church leader or anything in between that you could bring in internships, even a government agency could provide internships for these children. So also we can collaborate with other agencies. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, I've mentioned a few organizations to you today, and I hope that you'll take some of those names like Kids in Need of Defense and look up how you can help, reach out to them, learn more. They have A lot of those sites have databases of organizations that can help. Um, and articles that can help inform you in different areas. We also can partner with schools. So every child, when they are placed with a sponsor, that sponsor agrees that they will enroll that child in school. So that tells us like, hey, these children all across the US, we might not know exactly where they are, which is a limitation, but we do know that they're going to be found in our schools across the country. So let's work with schools. Maybe you specialize in a counseling background, an MFT, uh, have your doctorate in psychology, whatever that is. Can you come alongside, even a social worker, can you come alongside and train um, school counselors and teachers to recognize signs of trauma in these children that are coming? They might not know when a child is placed that has been unaccompanied, but can they look for some of those signs of trauma or experiences that children would benefit from counseling services or their entire family? or sponsor setting could go to counseling with them. So those kind of referrals are one of the places that ORR is relying on to make referrals. And it would be awesome if we could come alongside at a community level and equip our schools to do that well. And then in all of this, that we will be honoring the strengths and existing leaders. When I worked with Jill Zwires, who took me across the border to the 30, she has 30 shelters, not her, but she's connected to 30 shelters across the border that are many of them are migrant led or run by um, residents of Tijuana and have just seen the needs and responded, which is beautiful. And she insisted again and again and modeled to me a posture of listen, show up, meet the needs that they're asking for and don't do the work for them because there's great dignity in them doing the work. And I just thought that was such an important takeaway that we would not strip those that we're trying to help that we would not have in our minds they're poor um, because they might be economically disadvantaged and they might have been marginalized and stripped of power, but they're not, they're not impoverished and they have incredible strengths. So how can we come alongside and listen and not try to be a white person show or a white savior, but um, redistribute our wealth and our resources and invite um, 
these children into our homes and just allow them to share what we have. Many of us have something we can share and this doesn't require every family to be a sponsor. Not everyone is cut out for that, but think of if even one family in every church took in a child or in every community took in a child and that family's community could wrap around them and help provide the services and support they need to do that long-term without caregiver burnout. There's a quote I wanna leave you with um, on the recommendations for community-based advocacy before we move into a couple other areas, which is by Richard Rohr. And I just, I ran across that this week and I just thought of you all that would be listening today. And um, that quote says about advocacy this, only through relationships can we know what kind of help or advocacy is truly desired. Solidarity is not about I'm helping you, but a commitment to walking and learning together. And of course, learning together requires us to be in dialogue with the understanding that I have much to learn. So let's pursue this work with humility and with listening and with dialogue and relationships, because I think relationships are key for any kind of the change that we wanna see in the ways that we're seeing the most pain in our society right now. So what are the recommendations here beyond what we can do? Where does this work need to be furthered? There are a couple of glaring gaps that I saw as I talked with um, other advocates who've been in this work much longer than me, who were my teachers in this process. And a couple of the major needs that the university, my friend Maria Silva down at the University of San Diego and World Relief of Southern California both talked about a lack of a tracking system. There's not a long-term tracking system in place um, to keep track of where these children go long-term. And um, like ORR said, they wait for sponsors and families to call back for a resource, but that's kind of a, um, a passive, more reactive way of servicing and educating families on what's available than it is a proactive one. So a long-term tracking system would be incredible if we could work with the government somehow to establish a system of trust and safe sharing of information to know where children are found and how they can be contacted by service providers and local advocates that are safe and verified. That would be incredible for like a family counseling center that specializes in Central American culture to be able to walk along these kids and these families. Um, there's also a need for community development in Central America to continue and KIND and other organizations, micro lenders are already doing that kind of economic redevelopment. But obviously we're seeing these waves that I, I didn't mention earlier, but while the numbers of immigration, the numbers crossing as um, that are immigrating to the US are, are not changing dramatically in the total numbers, but we're seeing less and less individual men coming for work to send money back, money back to their families. And we're seeing an explosion in the proportion of the immigrants that are coming that are families and individual children. So let's go back to families that are fleeing for their lives. Let's create stability again, and let's share our wealth and our generosity of leadership to support indigenous leaders that are already in Central America that are probably completely overwhelmed. So that's a continued area that was outside the scope of my research, but just a glaringly needed um, source of further action and research. And last, there's a need for families waiting in Mexico in the area of legal services. Organizations and um, law institutions like UC Davis Law School, McGeorge School of Law here in Sacramento, I know they, they have clinics as well as um, mobile clinics that go down to the border. Just this last spring, there was an or they, a group that went down from McGeorge School of Law to help assist asylum seekers. And again, this is not unrelated to the issue of unaccompanied and separated migrant children because children, are, a, a few hundred children since last October, between October and February of this year, had been sent across the border in Brownsville, Texas, because the conditions of waiting in Mexico were so dangerous that loved ones and adults and parents um, were sending it across their children. And so we need some assistance and protection happening there in Mexico while they're waiting to create strong cases to help um, them prepare for their interviews so that they can reduce some of the trauma and fear factor that's happening there. But I think there are some legal boundaries to where and how you can practice as a lawyer and maybe some fear and lack of awareness there. So we need to grow the awareness and help overcome the obstacles of getting legal assistance down to families 
on the Mexico side and to help families that are also um, waiting for their trial to be seen. We need more advocates. And one of the ways that you can become a legal advocate, if you have um, a mind for law and the time to give to that, you can actually go through Catholic Charities and other organizations like World Relief to become a legal advocate that is licensed or um, recognized by the Department of Justice. And there's training and schooling and verification under a nonprofit or organization that's required for that. But that's a huge area where we can serve. And in conclusion, I just encourage each of you to take note of what's stirring in you right now, pay attention to the discomfort, pay attention to the longing to get involved, and then consider, you know, why not? Why, why, why not get involved um, and overcome whatever is a barrier to doing the small thing that you can do to make a difference in the lives of these children who are coming by the tens of thousands every year to our country. If you want to see a little picture and bring it home a little bit more of how many are actually coming to your community or to your state each year, since we don't have a tracking system that tells us exactly where that's that's published, um, check out um, children released to states by or to sponsors by state if you look up children released to sponsors by state um, and then go for a link that's to ORR's website, you'll actually see a listing of how many children are released to states around the country every year and that puts into perspective um, how many children are really entering into our communities and what a nearby issue this really is for any of us. And even if you're in a rural community or far from an area that has shelters for children, um, pray about, consider, and talk with your community about how you can create a fundraiser, how you could open your home, how you could redevelop your home to have a space for a child or a teen or a young adult in your home or a family. Maybe you have an in-laws quarters or a travel trailer that could be converted into a living space while a family's getting their feet under them. Think about what a resource that could be while a family's getting their asylum application completed and while they're then getting a work visa. How can you assist? And I hope that you will continue to follow Global. We're going to be publishing this um, presentation. Some of you will be watching this later, and thank you for tuning in. Um, some of you will be wanting to read the full um, um, presentation, the full paper that was created about this. And I hope that you'll take time to read that or to request our pamphlet that will be created. And um, I'm excited to move forward with Global to actually act on these recommendations and begin to partner with advocacy groups, universities, and other institutions around the US that want to partner with us to get involved in this topic and to take this on the ground to raise awareness and equip people with a toolkit for advocacy, which I hope that you leave here today with that toolkit um, a little clearer and some questions a little bit more on the forefront with access to make this more attainable and understandable because it's a big topic. And, um, and then even if you can't engage from your community, engage nationally. Look up KIND, who is doing Kids in Need of Defense. They're doing incredible work at the border um, and incredible work back in Central America. And let's amplify awareness of this issue and involvement in advocating for these little ones. And I ended with this picture of a mother and her child because, again, um, our ideal world is that children will be with safe families that are their own loved ones, that they will not be separated. So let's work even in this um, soon to be post COVID era and current COVID era to consider where we can help raise our voice and appeal to our representatives. Um, KIND and other organizations have um, connections for you to figure out who your representatives are and then how to reach out to those and some templates for letters you can write. But let's raise our voice and continue to dig into this topic so we can understand how to keep families together and when um, children have had to be separated, how we can be a new family to these kids and a good community, a good nation to them. Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to engaging with your questions in a moment. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was a wonderful presentation on such an important issue. And when we're juggling so many concerns in our community, we cannot forget the importance of protecting the most vulnerable. And you are really addressing a project that touches on the most vulnerable. And so we are so grateful that you've done this. Now, audience, I just want to remind you again that we are here for the live broadcast of the Children Caught in Crises Forum. If you are just joining us, we want to encourage you to join us with questions and comments. There is a question box where you can type in your comments and questions and we will continue uh, this conversation with Sarah. Now as we go into this I also want to remind everyone that you know Sarah's 
presentation, as well as the PowerPoint slides and her paper, will all be uh, posted on our website. We'll be sharing that with you through social media, and we encourage you to not only watch it again to get the details and to read the paper in full, but to also share it with others. There are those who may not be able to be here in this broadcast, and we want to encourage you to, uh, to provide that outreach to them. Now we're gonna switch into some time of Q&A. And uh, so I wanna sort of get us started, Sarah, with some initial questions that have come in and um, and just have you kind of respond. Now, first you mentioned you know, COVID, um, but even prior to that, we talk about the fact that there's so many different issues in our world and not everybody is in California, not everybody is located in border areas. So tell us why the general public, you know, the rest of the United States should be so concerned about these issues of these children um, that are concentrated in some of these other regions of the country. Well, that concentration that you just uh, mentioned, Sosama, is one of the reasons why there is need to disperse um, the care of this population across the nation. There are families coming across the border who are um, waiting for their child to be seen, who may be separated from their children if they don't have adequate housing. And then there's, again, the issue, the primary issue here of um, tens of thousands of children waiting on wait lists for care and the need is much greater than than the access and children coming into border areas like in Southern California it's the hardest for those families in Southern California because of the cost of living and the housing sizes that many families find themselves in it's very difficult for families at the border right in the largely immigrant impacted communities to retain this population and to care for them adequately. There are a lot of um, legal services and advocates available, but even places like the Bay Area where families might have a little bit bigger houses, um, it's also expensive there, but depending on where people live, it's better for these families and these children to be housed and, and spread out across the country. And again, it's looking inward at what we believe about the most vulnerable. And even if we're physically separated from um, an issue, um, what do we believe about um, the value of a human life? And and um, does it does it negate our need to act just because it isn't that they're not being housed right in our in our community? Um, there's been a need for families in even rural states recently that I've seen as I'm following these advocates now on social media for families in you know Michigan and other places where where sponsors have last minute backed out and now this person's on a plane. So mm -hmm. you would be surprised as you research what's happening in your area that you can do important work, even if it's behind the scenes or awareness raising, maybe you could create, there's this, um, I can't remember the exact name, but there's a group of um, grandmas that are for advocacy mm -hmm. that have done like walking campaigns and other things to raise awareness. And they're all over the US. And um, I can find that name later and post it on social media for all of you that are interested. But there are groups like that that may feel the furthest removed as older white Americans who have had a comfortable life and haven't really had to deal with this, mm -hmm. um, who have taken ownership of this issue. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention is if you look at children released to sponsors by state, I think that's very eye-opening because you'd be surprised at the numbers. And you'll also see that some states are so impacted that let's help out those really impacted states from elsewhere and share the resources that we can create and the social capital that we can share with these children. And then also check out immigrantadvocates.org, which is a search engine and you can search by your geographic area, which is very helpful to recognize what organizations like locally in Sacramento, there aren't very many that are specifically focused on unaccompanied minors because the one shelter we had locally was closed down. It was um, having issues with the care that was provided. Mm -hmm. um, but according to immigration advocates, there were a bunch of other organizations that are providing for the Latino, Latina community and we're specializing in Central American support. And so I've been able to find those kind of resources locally that are secondhand definitely serving this population, especially given the numbers in California. So if we dig a little deeper and use our imaginations, I think we start to realize both the human connection and the social connection to this topic from wherever we are in the US. 
you know, that's great to know. And I, you know, I'm reminded a little bit with those examples that you gave that, you know, we, no one can do it all, but everyone can do something, you know, whether it's the grandmother's group or whether it's a community or whether it's an individual, there's always something we can do. And I think putting our creativity and our hearts together on this could be very important. I want to ask a question in light of everything that we're experiencing right now. We have some major issues in our country and they take up a lot of time and space on media and in other outlets. And so sometimes these issues that used to be so significant suddenly don't get any attention. And so I want to have you share a little bit why it is so important to have more coverage and discussion about these topics, especially now. Yeah, I mean, I think that we can forget because whatever's trending fills the page and fills our mindset and fills our conversations. And um, I think we've seen a good example of that with the Black Lives Matter and the Blackout Tuesday and different things that have happened this week. The power of our posts and the power of our hashtags controls for better, or for worse. Um, I know there were even difficulties yesterday with Blackout Tuesday. Um, with blackout posts um, overwhelming what was needed to happen with true advocacy efforts around Black Lives Matter. And so I think it's remembering as if you Google, if any of you Google um, some articles from New York Times and ProPublica and just others that came straight to the top for me when I researched last week what's happening with COVID, I'm now seeing more of those that um, that rapid deportation and this swift change and um, kind of vetoing of previous policies that protected children is happening so much right now. And, um, and immigrants, I think, are even more vulnerable in our country than they've been in recent years. And mm -hmm. so we've got high numbers and we have um, a lot shifting very rapidly. So the need for advocacy is especially high during the present pandemic. And mm -hmm. I think that while we need to be measured and, and cautious about um, disease prevention and spread during the season, if we allow fear to be our dominant factor rather than faith and a sense of justice and shared humanity with and you know intellectual discernment and prayer and all of that um i think if we let fear get in the way then we will not be reaching out to these communities and we'll be more hunkering down and fearful for our own lives and um so i think without getting too political there's just a lot of room for digging into what's happening from a human rights standpoint and from a child welfare standpoint during COVID. and it's very relevant and it's it's definitely a lot is changing right now Mm -hmm. And that's where groups like um, American Civil Liberties Union are rising up and doing incredible work. So I think we can become more educated as we follow groups like that. Mm -hmm. You know, what I will say to our audience, too, is this idea that oftentimes what is a salient hides what is also important. And so mm -hmm. salient is typically what you're seeing right in front of you. It's the immediate. It's, the, you know, it's that big headline. But that doesn't minimize the significance of these other issues. And so we have to be very vigilant in keeping track of what's happening with children and other vulnerable populations, no matter what the context, and even if there isn't great coverage, it's seeking that information out. So thank you for highlighting that. Another question that's come up is, you know, can you speak a little bit to this idea of children being reunified uh, with parents, uh, especially after separation? You know, is, does that happen? Is it very difficult to happen? What are some of the, the barriers to that? Yeah, so many of you might know that back in 2018, when there was a April to June trial period of the Trump zero tolerance policy, mm -hmm. there was a rapid separation of children happening during that period. Families that were coming intact, but then were separated at the border because there was zero tolerance for the adults that were crossing the border. They were all being apprehended and detained and processed um, as criminals for crossing into the U.S. And um, so the children, that was in in um, attempt to slow the rate of immigration, but what it did is it actually rapidly lost children in the system where they didn't have, some children they knew who they belonged to, but many other children were lost in the system. I believe there's still around 2,500 children um, who are still in the U.S. waiting reunification. And KIND, Kids in Need of Defense, is actually one of the organizations that's working with those parents now. Just this year, they had a press release where they are helping parents from Central America fly into LA and go through a process of reunification with those children and the legal process needed to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, so reunification is happening, but I mean, in that example, it took almost two years for that process to be um, for advocates and very well organized organizations like KIND to work towards that process. And there are still many that are separated. And for some, um, they will just need foster families and other options because there is no next of kin available or known. And for, fam for kids that flee abusers, um, family reunification is not always the best option. 
And some children who are close to aging out will refuse to be placed with next of kin sponsors because they're the maternal grandparents of their abusive mother. Mm -hmm. And that's not always the case. Sometimes families um, should be reunified and just need the resources, the um, economic stability to make that happen and to break the poverty cycle. Um, sometimes parents are doing the right thing or the best thing in their mind and the only thing they can do by getting their child a bus ticket and getting them to the United States. Mm -hmm. So it just is a case by case and um, some of the law centers in Southern California are very insightful about that kind of thing. And Kids in Need of, of Defense is a great website on the present challenges and opportunities for parent reunification. Yeah, and it is complicated because the legal process is not a quick process. You know, it doesn't matter what the context is, what the topics are, it is not a quick process. So there are so many humanitarian needs that arise in the interim. And uh, where are these children being held? And what are the contexts and circumstances that they're experiencing in those contexts? There could be additional abuse. They might be lacking in services. They could be lacking in even, even food. So there's many different things that we have to consider, you know, as they're going through that process that you mentioned. Um, very, very important and difficult uh, all the way around. Um, we have time for maybe one more question. That is, um, so you've talked about different things that we can do as a community, um, you know, through these various government outlets, etc. But that all takes time, as we talked about, and those are things that don't, don't happen immediately. But oftentimes, people are looking for something to do right away. You know, what are sort sort of next steps or immediate steps? So, what is maybe an immediate next step? for a community member and or for our government to do and to, uh, in this context? Yeah, I would say a couple of the things you could do first are to go to Kids in Need of Defense, um, read some more in areas of their, they have a whole clearinghouse of articles that are really helpful. So read more about topics that you want to know more about. Um, becoming educated is a great first step. Um, also check out immigrationadvocates.org and see what organizations are working locally. There might be trainings. Mm -hmm. For example, you could help with um, some family services through a Latino Leadership Council or if you're in Sacramento area, NorCal Resist does break light, fix it clinics and, um, and helping with asylum seekers um, applications and things like that. And I think just beginning to stay aware, like I am now um, constantly following and reading articles and the needs posted by my friend Jill Zwires at the border. And mm -hmm. she posts when families need food deliveries and when a family needs a sponsor or a placement. And I've been able to reach out to people since then. So those are very local level. Just start following grassroots people if you want to get closer to the, to the issue on a very personal level and start building relationships that way, even virtual relationships when you mm -hmm. feel like you can get to know the stories and the faces a little bit behind this, then it's a more of a personal issue and it's harder to look away or forget that this is important. Um, and maybe look at your home. I mean, even in this season, families especially need a safe alternative to, um, in to uh, the detainment and the detention facilities where coronavirus can be so rampant. So you know, maybe even consider, could you provide a safe place for our family to be so that they can stay together and stay healthy? So those are some starting places. Also, if you want to work more on the legal side, um, change.org and some other organizations have um, petitions that you can sign and other things for the fair treatment of children. And um, if you look up, and I can look up that more too, if you want to follow me on Facebook, more opportunities specifically for things that are helping confront the rapid deportation of children right now. I know organizations are doing that and appealing. So maybe look up, you know, how you can write a letter to your representative about this issue and use your voice. I mean, think, I think we've seen the power of grassroots organizing um, in some positive ways, even in this tumultuous time. So those are some key areas. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Sarah Bond, for your great work uh, in presenting this topic and in researching it. And as we've shared with our audience, we will be posting Sarah's presentation as well as her paper on our website. You can find it at www.globaljusticeonline.org slash video series, where you can find her video and a number of other videos that we offer to the community. Just for a note to all of our audience members, Global Justice is a resource on this topic and many other justice 
justice topics. We have a clearinghouse with various topics, including topics related to children. If you're interested in continuing to dig into these topics, feel free to visit us in our clearinghouse to learn more about these issues and organizations addressing those issues. In addition, we have programs such as our global market, and that global market allows us to support a wide variety of advocacy organizations, including those that are addressing children's concerns. We'll be offering products very soon that will specifically help children's advocacy work. And we are very pleased to also know that Sarah Bond will continue her work not only on this topic, but related topics through our Children's Advocacy Project. So please be watching for updates as we do more to help the children and other most vulnerable people in our communities. Again, we thank you so much for joining us for this particular session, and we look forward to sharing more information and resources with you. Visit us again at www.globaljusticeonline.org, and I hope you'll join us again for our next video series. Thank you. Thank you.